<clears throat> so I asked you how you're doing. You're like, we got holes. We're struggling. We're, we got fresh, true freshmen in the lineup. Joey, these are these are problems of wealth, right? These are conversations that 10 years ago, I don't know that you would be having as the as one of the coaching staff at Princeton University. Would you agree with that? Yeah, no, I mean, obviously, you know, we've been progressing, it seems like every single year, you know, we've been taking huge steps forward uh, as a program. And coming into the season, you know, we had we had really high expectations, you know, high expectations for this team. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of things that have, you know, been either our own doing or not gone our way and things like that. And uh, it's tough, you know, it's definitely tough uh, when, you know, when you have true freshmen in the lineup, um, it's, it's a learn. there's a learning curve there, right? There's a learning curve um, and then dealing with injuries and stuff like that. Uh, but it sounds like I'm making excuses. I'm really not, you know, it, it's just the reality of what, of what it is. Um, I think we have, um, we have some, some seniors who, I think can do some damage in the postseason. I think we have some underclassmen that can do some damage in the postseason. So right now it's like we're taking it, you know, the cliche week by week. But, you know, we also have, you know, one eye, one eye towards the postseason, uh, kind of getting excited for that. So okay. Let's talk about it's difficult. It seems difficult to have the, the wear and tear of a college season, the mitigating the expectations of like, you do have seniors that are supposed to place in place high. Like you do have the glories of the world and you do have the Mondays of the world. These are, the, there are high expectations there, okay? How <clears throat> do you mitigate that and then how much more difficult does it become putting on a Princeton University course law? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, again, that's, uh, that's the reality of our situation. Um, the kids understand that coming in. Um, and, you know, some, some uh, transition really quickly and some take a little bit longer time to transition uh, just academically. But, uh, I think that's the one thing that every single one of our recruits uh, know or incoming freshmen know is that it is going to be uh, a tough transition. Uh, and it, it all depends on how they respond to it. If they ask for help and they utilize the resources that we have here at Princeton, if they utilize uh, us as coaches, if they utilize the other guys on the team, the upperclassmen, uh, it's going to be a shorter it's going to be a shorter learning curve, you know what I mean? And uh, but it is hard, you know. It's a it's the number one school in the country, right? It, it's it's that for a reason. And and again, I the guys understand it. We're very transparent from the beginning because here's the thing: we actually use it as kind of like um uh, almost like a filtering tool, right? We tell we tell every single recruit, hey, it's it's tough here. It's tough. I mean you can absolutely make it through. We also then tell them that, hey, in, you know, 15 years of Chris Ayer's been here as the head coach, every single kid has graduated. So in, in one breath, we're telling them it is hard and you that's have to work. That's a pretty good number there, Jojo. That's a pretty good number. It's, it's an unbelievable number because I don't think there's one, I don't think there's one school in D1 wrestling that can say the same thing. Uh, in that time frame, in the last 15 years, you've had every single kid graduate uh, and then add, oh, yeah, plus it's Princeton. It's an Ivy League institution. It's the number one school in the country. So, again, I think um, I think our guys, you know, they do understand that. But again, you know, and we're we're um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, we understand it. Right. We understand that these guys are, are put through the ringer a little bit academically. So we have to we have to alter things on our side. You know, if we if we see a kid and he looks like a zombie coming through the door, it's like, all right, dude, you got to go <laughs> get out of here. Go get some sleep, you know, because they'll be up. I mean, they'll be up till two, three in the morning. 
maybe even four o'clock in the morning doing doing work, you know, doing work. So so we have to we we've had we've had to definitely adjust on our end to make sure that we have uh, our guys' best interest in mind. Is there a case? And you don't have, obviously you don't have to say names, but can you think of a case where a kid did come in? And he was completely ill prepared, like didn't know that he was walking into the number one school in the country. And he was just like, what were you thinking, dude? Yeah. I mean, we've had guys, I mean, again, yeah, we've had guys who, man, they they we they they were brought kicking and screaming over the graduation line, you know? Um, and they made it really difficult. And honestly, it was it's just the choices that they make, right? It's like that's that that's what it all comes down to. There's there again. There, this place is is this place for a reason, and they have things in place for all students, not just athletes. Every single student that's here had these amazing resources that are you know at their fingertips. It's whether you are willing to use them and and do it. Um, so and there's guys who boom they know like ah uh, you know and every single kid needs them right. Maybe some kids need them a little less than others, but you all, they all need the resources that are here. It's just, uh, it's just whether they actually take advantage of them. Right. And, and we tell our guys like, Hey, we can't make, we can't do it for you. Just like I can't cut the weight for you. Like you have to want to do it. You have to want to, you know, go to these, you know, office hours and study hall and all this other stuff. Like you got to want to do it. So um some some guys are easier uh to deal with just because again they're self-motivated and some some guys aren't hmm. and what is the because it seems like and one of the things that is very difficult to convey through this medium is just how symbiotic the Princeton wrestling staff is. I've been around you guys. You guys work very well as a team. And you both chops and you have a good time. But you work very well as a team. Bray has a role and Harris has a role and Joe has a role and Jackson has a role and, and Ruth has a role. And every it seems, especially as an outsider, that you guys have a very symbiotic relationship. So what is the protocol what is the the go? What is the plan that is in place when you see a kid that walks in that might be a little over his head academically? Maybe they're maybe they're not taking advantage of the resources. What plan of action is sprung into at that point? So that's usually that's usually airs is uh, he has a, a keen sense for that. Um, you know, just being here for that long. And I, I've been here pretty long too. Um, I guess he has a, um, a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, he is maybe a little bit more sympathetic uh, to those where I am, you know, I am not in regards to where it's like, hey, uh, you have to get your shit done, you know, get your shit done. That's it. But, you know, obviously, Ayers, he's the head coach, you know, he's the driver of the ship. He, um, you know, he, again, he has open, open lines of communication with our uh, academic liaison who works, you know, not only with the faculty, but works with the athletic department. So that once he kind of realizes a kid is a, you know, this kid is struggling, uh, he brings, you know, and honestly, the liaison probably knows before we do. So they kind of, you know, unless the kid literally says, hey, man, I, I think I bombed this this midterm or this final uh, and comes to us right away before the grades are even out, uh, then that's when we can kind of get other people involved. But this place, uh, for the most part, is it pretty much has a handle on it. Um, you know, academically, it's uh, there, there are no special things for athletes. Uh, all the students are the same. Uh, the way they live, uh, they're all called, they're, they live in residential colleges. What that means, it's just a, a series of dorms wrapped around a dining hall. But within that, you have like a dean of studies, you have a dean of student life. Uh, so they- Each one of these, each one of these, 
like small communities or colleges in the university has their own you know x and y and z yes okay. and and the and the professors will communicate with those deans uh and say hey you know so and so is struggling uh we probably need to pull them in we probably either need to get uh you know get get him a get him a tutor or maybe this class you know maybe they should drop this class you know depending on what their course load is um so there's a lot of options that our guys have and the deans you know when they reach out they have like a almost like a course correction uh plan that they'll go over with that student um so again not saying that that, that guys don't struggle and and guys you know sometimes they fall through the the cracks i mean people are human uh people you know again they overlook some things so not saying our system is perfect but for 10 years it's been pretty pretty damn good and like i said i mean we we literally just point to the fact that we've had a hundred percent graduation uh in 15 years uh, of chris eric being here so every single kid recruited and has come here has graduated that's pretty incredible it's just hearing that again it's just like oh that's and, and zero and zero transfers uh before graduation so pat rucky was a graduate student transfer so he graduated from princeton and used his last year of eligibility uh at michigan uh and i think we had the same thing with chris perez um but he was more like an injury like he got an extra year uh because of uh you know his he had two years affected by injury so he used that at indiana but graduated from princeton so you know, again, when kids get here, like they're they're immersed into the community right away, um, and, and it's and it's something that's important to them, and you know they work hard at it. And again, they worked hard their whole high school career to get them to a place like this. It's like they're not going to let this opportunity slip through their fingers. That makes sense. That makes sense. You, <clears throat> the the level and caliber of of student athlete is just different. I guess, you know, I, I guess the, the, the question becomes then, you as a coach, have you taken over the last 10 years, have you taken more pride in recruiting or more pride in developing athletes? It's a good question. I know, um, right? I don't think I'm good at this. No. <laughs> um, it's funny because, you know, like, I love the challenge of the recruiting, right? I like going after a kid who um, is not a slam dunk, right? You know, getting them here and really, you know, maybe Princeton was never even on their radar. And then, you know, them leaving a, a visit being like, whoa, like, I didn't even expect this. Right. Like mm -hmm. this has totally opened my eyes to not only what the opportunity is school wise, but all the resources that are in place uh, a athletically and what I can do as a wrestler. Um, and then it's also, you know, I love wrestling. Right. I love wrestling. I want I love coaching. I, I'm very passionate. So, you know, having a kid come in as a freshman and making sure that I'm putting as much time into them. And helping them develop their skills uh, to get to be an All American, to be you know a national champ, and things like that. It's like that's I take a lot of pride in that. Um, so I would say I probably take more pride in when they get here, you know, like developing them and and making them into that wrestler they they dream to be. Uh, but it's also like the competitive the competitor in me. I wanna I wanna win every recruiting battle. Like, I, I like the challenge of going after a kid who might say, like, yeah, coach, I don't know, man. I don't I don't even know if Princeton's in my top 10. And I'm like, all right, we'll see. You know, all we need you to do is come here. You come here for a visit, I promise you the, at, the least we'll do is confuse you. You know, we'll have you very confused walking away from Princeton, okay, where you thought you had things figured out. When you leave this place, you're like, oh, damn. What the hell? What, what did Princeton just throw at me? So, so again, I 
you know, again, I think I probably take more pride in, in developing just because I, you know, I love, I love wrestling. I love working with the guys. Um, okay. Let's talk about <clears throat> expectations post graduation. Um, you have been a part of groups of people and teams and institutions that their expectation after attending school, if you were like, so if you're the best guy on, on Iowa roster, your expectation is to stick around for at least another quad. They'll find some money for you for an RTC and you wrestle for uh, an Olympic gold medal. If that doesn't work out, you find your way into coaching somehow. And that's, that's basically been the path of every successful college wrestler for a long time. That's not the case at Princeton. But, but I, I think the opportunity is there to go wrestle post-college. You guys have Colo, who was a Princeton grad, wrestling at an international level. But the expectation is not do a, do a cycle, start coaching. That is not the expectation. How do you mitigate that thought process with dads or moms or athletes that are like, I'm just a wrestler, dude. That happens to get good grades. How do you, how do you kind of present like, hey, look what Pat Glory did this past summer. He made incredible connections through, um, what, the finance? It, some, he, something to do with finance. Like, he had an internship. How do you tell a mom or a dad that, like, look, this is the, the world is bigger than just wrestling? So, so, uh, well, I think right now, uh, I think we're actually in a perfect uh, position now where we're recruiting kids who actually have world and Olympic dreams. Uh, and I think we have the infrastructure in place for them to be able to, to chase their goals, right? To chase down those dreams. Um, yeah, that's not going to be every single kid that comes through our, our wrestling door, right? Uh, you know, a kid might be like, Hey, as much as I do, like my body's just run down. I don't have, I don't have another four years in me. Um, but another kid might be like, yeah, I'm, I am going to graduate from Princeton. I'm going to go into the NJRTC and wrestle, you know, four years. And, um, and then after, after those four years, and then I'll, and then I can sit back and, you know, rely on my Princeton degree to, you know, I can start my career. Um, so I think um, that in, in that right now, we have that in place. Um, so just talk about Pat Glory. So he's, uh, he's talked about, you know, sticking around and training through the Olympics. Um, he got a job offer from um, from Citibank. Uh, that's where he did his internship. So he accepted that offer. Then he went back and talked to them and said, hey, I had this amazing opportunity to train for the Olympics. Would you still? And they said, absolutely. We'll just, you know, once you're done training for the Olympics, your job offer will be here and you will start. You can't do both. You can't. There, there is a world where, where both can kind of coexist. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, again, it's, uh, it's like, why wouldn't you have why wouldn't you want that, right? Why wouldn't you want to to then once your 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 competition career is over, then get to fall back on the number one coveted degree in the United States? Um, and I think that's something that is intriguing to a lot of the recruits we're talking to, and a lot of them they they see they're like, yeah, I know what the NGRTC is. I know Reese Humphrey is the head coach there, and Nate Jackson is is ranked you know top five in the world and and stuff like that. So they you know the the best recruits are taking notice, and then they're like, wow, on top of them having you know the infrastructure for me to train post graduation, they're also offering me an amazing, you know, uh, you know, undergraduate experience. 
Um, so I think that's something that's so, so unique to us, uh, where it, it's like if we didn't have success, uh, you know, with the NJRTC, it would be a lot harder. It would be a lot harder because we're selling kids on a dream. You know, we're 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 selling them on a on a theory, right? Where we don't have to. We put we put guys on the world team. Our first our first full year in in you know business you know business as the NGRTC we put two guys on the world team, and yeah you know now you have Nate Jackson again. He's beating guys who are who are world medalists. So we're doing we're doing the right things, and it's whether those kids want to want a little bit unique and different experience. Mm, that's interesting. Let's shift gears to you post college your body wasn't cooperating with you. You did make a run a little bit after college. I remember you went to the AC Open, which is now the Bill Farrell. You know, there were some ideas and then what do you wish, what do you wish someone would have told you then that is very apparent to you now? Is it hang them up? Is it, well, do the stem cell research, you know, whatever. What, what advice would you, or even you have given your 23, 24, 25-year-old self? So I'm going to change, I'm going to change it a little bit on you and not really, I, I wish somebody, I wish somebody forced me to wrestle freestyle when I was in high school. I think that was one thing that I wish, even though I was a, a multi-sport athlete and I, and I took my, I took the other sports just as serious as I did wrestling. But I think I, I think I would have trained and competed longer if I had more experience in freestyle. If I would have went to Fargo when I was a freshman or sophomore in high school, um, and, and really, then it would have been more embedded. Then I would have done it more in college, where literally I had four freestyle. Or no, wait, I had eight freestyle matches in college. I went two and two at University Nationals as a freshman and sophomore in college. So it's like that it just wasn't, it wasn't embedded, but I was a competitor. I love to compete. Like that's where I was at my best. So, so what, after my first year coaching at Hofstra, I'm on the, I'm on the floor, I'm coaching guys in the, in the, the NCAA semifinals and I'm getting the same feels that I was when I was competing. You know, I, you know, I'm getting chills right now, just thinking about it. Um, and right when, when we left that tournament, I was like, I need to compete. I need to compete. I, I miss it. I love it. I want to do it. Um, and at that time, it, it's like I gave, I gave it everything I had, right? It's just I didn't have the experience needed to be at a high level, right? Like I just mm. didn't, I didn't have the, the, you know, the, the match wear, wear and tear on my body that I needed, right? It's, it was like, if that's a good wear and tear, right? Again, I, I pro going into that run in 08, I for sure did not have more than 15 freestyle matches in my life, <laughs> in my life, you know? <laughs> and, and the crazy thing is, Mike, is the NYAC was my first competition. My first match was a guy from Russia. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it was their two or three or whatever, but it was a Russian. And, and all Ru most Russians are really good. And I if they're making a trip over here, they're pretty and, good. And and I beat the shit out of them. So I'm like, whoa, you know, I could actually be good at this, I think. I don't know. You know, and I'm still doing the same crap I was doing in college. Um, but, you know, for me at that time, it was something I needed. And, and you know, my now wife, then girlfriend, uh, just gave birth to my son, Chase. Uh, so literally he was born... Uh, I want to say a week and a half before the NYAC. So, um, like as much as as much as I was like, I want to compete and whatever. I was like, this is my one shot, though. I can't. I was like, I can't do it. I can't do it to my to my girlfriend, my you know, then fiance, and my son. Right? Like, I just I can't do it because you have to be selfish. 
right? You and, and and there's guys who did it with families, and and I don't I don't. There's nothing against. I have nothing against what they did. They probably had a, an amazing relationship with their wife and stuff like that. I just yeah, knew. Hold on a second. Let's let me pause it there though. Right? Who was the last guy to make a team? That is a was a full time coach because you were a full time coach at the time too. Yeah. Yes. So like, you you yeah. say you got to be selfish. You do. You have yeah. to. And that's why you see guys like Von Arrow were stuck. Like they they had a a hair their ass. They want to compete again. So he he leaves Virginia Tech, goes to OU, and wrestles one you know, through the rest of the quad. I can't think of another dude that was full time on staff somewhere and made the team. I think Freyer. And I don't. I he. I don't even know he because he. I think he was the strength coach at Iowa. Like right. that's not. Well, that's, that's, he's on staff. Yeah, he's training, dude. Like <laughs> you know, like and he'll he'll probably t say the same thing. You know, like yeah, there's yeah. no there's no way he could have been like a second assistant or a first assistant and doing all the all the duties in the office and, and recruiting and, and coaching on the weekends and stuff like that and and still be able to make it. I don't care how good you are. You know what I mean? Not. So mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean you're absolutely right. I mean I you know I didn't even think about the fact that I was literally like I'm and I didn't get paid I didn't get paid to compete. Like I I got paid zero dollars. <laughs> zero dollars. I was a, a paid assistant and but I was like I wanted to compete. I still had that love and that passion I, I had that itch you know that i wanted to get out there and and freaking club somebody really hard and and have a match on the line when i'm you know winning or losing like i i just needed that one last you know one last trip you know uh, uh, mm -hmm. to compete and i i wound up getting hurt uh during it you know like during that and that wound up really kind of sealing my fate in regards to just being done um you know, I, I hate the fact that that's how it, it ended, you know, with an injury. But I, you know, I just, I was like, there's, I, I love it, but I also, for me, I'm like, if I'm not, if, I, if I'm not 100% healthy, then I'm out. Like, I, I, I need to be, I need it's to be so 100%. Hard to do that level at 100%. That's what, that, that's what I'm saying, Mike. Like, I, I, I was realistic with myself. And saying that I need to be a hundred percent to even compete with these guys, right? Like I got a shot. If I'm a hundred percent, I got a shot. But if I'm not a hundred percent, every there's too many things against me, right? There's too many things. These guys are seasoned. They they under they're they're really good in parterre, right? They're really good in situations where like I need I need to be training to be in these situations and then like again after i wrestled at um i wrestled in colorado with dave schultz you know and and literally I, I got hurt that week at you know at the training center and i tried to wrestle through it and i just couldn't do it you know i, I hurt my neck and you know i had like you know the the the, the tingling and the numbness and the pain and i was like man i, I tried to push through it I gave myself a little bit of off, tried to push through it towards, you know, the, the end of March. And I was just like, there's no way, man. There's no way I'm, I'm going to be able to, to make, a, make a run at the Olympics with the best guys. I mean, you got guys like, you know, Sam Hayeswinkle, Nick Simmons, uh, Henry Cejudo. I mean, he, he won it then. I mean, like, I, there's not a doubt in my mind that I felt like I could compete with those guys if I was 100%. But the way I was then, it was it, it, it would have been – you know, mute for it. Yeah. Yeah, that becomes, uh, you know, it's almost, and, and it's easy for me to say because it wasn't me, but it's almost better because there's nothing worse than a guy who thinks they can do it, is healthy. And then you just see that, you see the years compound, the years of interest of wrestling, right? Like, the, the the interest in wrestling is just like these little nicks and these little you lose step. You you weren't you weren't any less fast in two thousand and eight than you were in two thousand five. I can tell you that one hundred percent. 
but it, what's 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 really kind of hard to watch is like uh an athlete that just hangs on a little bit too long so it's almost like it's almost like it's better that like there was an acute like all right dude this is it this is it yeah because um i guess maybe that's even what makes guys like jb even more impressive like that dude's still got it he's 30 33 34 that dude's still got it still wrestling at a really high level you know Hey, can I add one thing just before we, we move on? Uh, yeah. Mike, Wi-Fi is absolutely atrocious right now. You're, you're, oh yeah, you're, you're, you're glitching. And there was, a, there was a problem for about 20 seconds where you were frozen. And uh, oh, I was sure. just. <laughs> oh, this, you know what it is? It's, it's difficult. It's like 70 and sunny every day here. They can't get certain things right. It's just, it's, it's a difficult process. I had to bust your chops a little bit. <laughs> All right. Hey, um, I, well, I want to. I want to add one more thing because you're talking about yeah. like you know. I think it was easier for me to walk away at that point. Going back to my original, like what I answered, like I wish somebody got me into freestyle. But I guess me not being in it and me not having a goal of being an Olympic champ that wasn't my dream. Right. Being an Olympic champ was not my dream. My dream was being an NCAA champ. Right. That was like when I was in high school, I'm watching guys like, you know, Stephen Abbas and, and guys win national titles. And I'm like, that's what I want to do. I want to I want to win a national title. And so for me, I guess it was easier because I accomplished my goal and my dream. And this other thing, I was like, I want to try and chase this. But I felt I felt at at peace. I was mm -hmm. I was fine with me saying like, "Hey, I'm done competing." I was good. I know there's guys who you know when they're seven years old, they have that dream of being a, an Olympic champ and a world champ, and that's amazing and that's awesome. I was never exposed to that. I I didn't have that dream. So again, it was easier for me to be like, you know what? All right, you know, like I, I'm good. I'm. It's time to now put focus into my coaching career putting focus into my family um and i was good with it mm. this let's take it to the next generation do you have your son who is 14 now or 15? 15. okay it's the wrestling freestyle so i i definitely exposed him um probably a year and a half ago when he was in seventh grade like towards the end of his seventh grade um uh, also, like eighth grade, he didn't compete, but I had him go into practices and stuff like that, uh, you know, me and him. So this summer will be his first real, like, you know, yeah, his, you know, he's going to be on the circuit. You know, he's going to be going, he's going to be wrestling at Freestyle States. He's going to be doing all the stuff that, um, you know, that I wish I did. Uh, and again, I'm just exposing him to it. Right. Mm -hmm. there, I'm not he he might never have a dream of, you know, being a, an Olympic champ or a world champ. And I'm fine with that. Right. Like that's that's fine with me. But freestyle, it will help him, you know, in folk style and vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I, I'm a true believer that they definitely coincide and they help each other. So we're going to he's going to do it because it's going to help him. Um you know, in his folk style and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. All right, Joel, do you have anything? Cause I gotta get moved here soon. Yeah, uh, I just wanna dig back in uh, a little bit earlier. You had talked about kind of, you know, your your academics there are so rigorous that oftentimes you'll need to alter, you know, practice schedules based off the kid, how they're looking. How do you go about doing that? And also still maintain the high level of training needed to compete at the highest level? So uh, I guess just to give you maybe a, one little piece of secret that we do um, every single day, we send out these guys. Uh, it's almost like a questionnaire. Um, it, it, it asks them, it's quick. It's like five questions. It's like, what's your mental state? You know, one to 10. Uh, what's your level of soreness? One to 10. Um, how's your hydration? How's your sleep? And one more, I forget what it is. Um, they fill that out. It's quick. 
uh, and that and we look at that prior to practice and we kind of make an adjustment. You know, if, if our guys are feeling good and they're ready to rock and roll mentally as a whole, we go hard. If we feel like, you know, hey, we just got out of midterms, everybody is totally shot mentally, maybe we pull it back a little bit. And here's the thing, like, uh, you know, the training is is so, I mean, it's the same but different, you know. And I think just the the mentality about it, it's like you don't have to grind. <laughs> you don't have to grind seven days out of the week for six hours, right? Like, literally, if you took a week off of practice, you would be just just fine. You would be able to wrestle a match just fine. Even if you took two weeks off, you took two weeks off of just wrestling, not wrestling live, right? Not wrestling live. You'd be just fine. You'd probably feel better. You'd probably be like, oh man, I feel fresh. You know, I'm not grinding, whatever. I'm like, so I think uh, our mentality is, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to be on the forefront of wrestling recovery, but our big saying is you got to earn your day off. You got to earn your day off, dude. Like if we're, if, if the plan is we're going hard on Monday and Tuesday, you better go friggin' hard on Monday and Tuesday because Wednesday, where we are, we give our guys um, a lot of uh, leeway and we trust them that they're going to take full advantage of the the rest and recovery day. Uh, they get, you know, they do. There's a block from ten o'clock uh, to about two o'clock where there's twenty minute massage sessions where they can sign up and get a twenty minute massage by a guy we bring in. Uh, and then during practice time, we actually have uh, a woman put them through a yoga session. So that like the, our Wednesdays are totally focused on rest and recovery. Um, but then it also comes down to knowing your athletes, right? So again, majority of the, the team might be lights out in regards to how they feel. They feel awesome. And then one guy, he is like super sore, his mental state, he's a wreck. Then we got to pull him in. Right. We got to pull him in and we got to be like, hey, what's going on? And then he tells us like, oh, you know, I was up all night doing a, a project or doing a, a report or writing a paper or whatever. Um, and I'm super sore. Like, you know, I tweaked my knee or whatever. It's then we have to then we have to adjust, you know, individually. So there's adjustments we make as a whole for the whole team. And then there's adjustments that you make individually. And I think that's the, the other thing is like you don't treat everybody equally, right? I think that's that's the misconception everybody thinks, like everybody's treated treated equally. Like there are guys. I think, I think you say that, and I don't know that anyone that has been in a college room would ever say that everyone is treated equally. I think they all know that there are people that are treated differently, for sure. Yeah, and 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 for one reason or the other, right? There's, you know, again, knowing, knowing your athlete, there's a guy who you can run through the brick wall five days a week and you know, he's going to come back on Monday and he's going to be ready to rock and roll. And there's some kids, man, maybe you got to pull back on them, right? They ran through a brick wall for two days. Then you got to be like, ah, you know, maybe we adjust the training plan for him. So, you know, and every, again, every, every single person is differently. Everybody responds differently to a coach, to a workout, to whatever. So I think that's that's what make the best the the best coaches are are the ones who adapt to their athletes, not having their athletes adapt to them. That's interesting. I wonder how for how long it was the absolute opposite. Because yeah. it was for a long time. I think it was for a long time, Joey. I think it was it was a long time. We're, it was just like, nah, they'll figure it out. Um, hey, sink or, sink, or swim, sink or swim sometimes, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let me get one more follow-up here on, uh, you know, your, your surveys. Um, that sounds like something, if you're doing it daily, can be – you can start to get inundated with data, right, where you have – I don't. How are you guys doing this? I guess technically, is it like literally a written sheet of paper? Is it you know like a Google form? How are you guys handling all this all this data that you're working with on a regular basis? Yeah, it's a Google form. Uh, it's a Google form. Um, 
coach Ayers takes a look at it. Um, you know, every afternoon he's, he's looking at it and, you know, trying to, you know, and again, it's, it's something more like, it's not like, oh, we're, we're, we're like, you know, crunching the data and, and seeing, well, if they're at a six, then, then we're good. But if they're at a five, oh, we're, it, it's a, it's a feel thing, right? Even though you have the data in front of you, it's still a feel thing, right? There might be a time, Hey, here's the thing. Also, there might be a time where it is by design that we're running these guys through the ringer and we're not changing plans. Right. But again, those are, everything is by design, but there's also like, you got to have a, you got, and I think that's where it comes in with us as a coaching staff, us being together for so long where airs is like, man, these guys are freaking sore and whatever. Like, what do you guys think? They, you know, what, like we had a plan to go really, really hard today. What are we thinking right now? And then we have a conversation about it. And it's like, and if we all say, hey, we're sticking to the plan, we're moving forward, they gotta, they gotta deal with this type of adversity, or we gotta be like, okay, you know what? They actually kind of wrestled like shit last week <laughs> or this past weekend. Maybe we do have to pull it back. You know, maybe we maybe they are run down a little bit. So it, it really comes down to not only knowing your athletes, but having uh, a really good line of communication with the coaches and everybody being on the same page um, where, where when we go to practice, everybody's confident that what the, the decision that was made was the right decision. Yeah, that builds a tremendous amount of trust between the athlete and the coach. You, you know, when you know that you can come to a coach and be like, dude, I'm in a world of hurt. And they're going to take that information and not put it off the side, actually examine it and take it into consideration. That's a big deal, Joe. And I, you know, I just, I guess the last question is, when did you see that shift in college wrestling? Because it, it wasn't so long ago where there was just a bunch of gable disciples running around college wrestling going, just work harder, just work harder, right? What year do you remember seeing that shift? Uh, I, I think, I, I want to say it was probably like maybe my for my second, it was probably my second or third year here when I would, and that we were talking, you know, about, about our training plan and, and trying to do things that are a little bit different. It really started with kind of yoga. Like we were like, Hey, we, you know, we, not only should we be working on our, on our flexibility, but it's also a great recovery workout, you know, like let's, and then that's when we kind of instituted, hey, every Wednesday, that's going to be an off the mat day, right? Now, that doesn't mean like, hey, if you got some weight issues or whatever, you got to come in and get a drill. But we're not going to have a structured practice and it's not going to be, you know, you're not going to have any live or anything like that. It's going to be the guys who have the luxury to stay off the mat can stay off the mat. And the guys who don't, it's going to be easy, though. It's you got to be smart. You can't like there's a reason why we're doing this. And it, it, it took a while for guys to get out of that mentality of like, wait a minute, you're, you're telling me I, I, I shouldn't go live. I shouldn't be going live five days a week. Like, uh, my, you know, what about my conditioning? And that's where it's like trust. It's like trust us. We promise you will be fine. OK, mm. and I think we're pretty transparent with our guys. Um, again, and, and this is an airs thing, right? Uh, it's, you know, I, I joke about my coach all the time, Dwayne Goldman. Um, he was, he was amazing just cause like, I don't, I didn't appreciate him when I was in it, you know, like I didn't appreciate his coaching, um, like what, what he was trying to do until I got out of college. And I'm like, Oh my God, that makes so much sense. What he was saying, I thought, I'm like, this is stupid. Why are we doing this? And then when I'm out of college, I'm like, it made perfect sense. I understand what he was trying to do. Can you, I wasn't give, me an Can you give me an uh, example? So his, thing, so his thing was we had there was no clocks, right? So there was never there was a there wasn't a clock in our room. So nobody knew. Like if he said, hey, sometimes he'd literally say, Hey, um, grab a guy. Uh, I want you to warm up a little bit and then we're gonna wrestle. 
he would never give you a time. He would say, we're just going to go wrestle. And so you didn't know. You, it could be a five-minute go. It could be a friggin' 35-minute go. You didn't know, right? So, uh, and, and that was one thing. He was like, he was like, hey, he's like, knowing, knowing what, like, what he didn't want you to do, he'd much rather you go, you know, you know, all out right all out for 10 minutes and 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 be totally spent the next 20 minutes if it was a 30 minute go then to know you had 30 minutes to wrestle and save yourself for the last five minutes and then go hard right he wanted you to get that fear out of your mind and just be like hey just go it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how much time you ha you you you're supposed to work out or you're supposed to wrestle um so that was just one example but for me i was like that's just stupid i should know how long i'm wrestling right i should know and you know and i butted heads with him but again i you know now it's like i have a great relationship with him because I, I i go back and and the things that i thought were absolutely like ludicrous the things that used to come out of his mouth i'm like what are you talking about with that? Like, why are you making us do this? And now I'm like, man, that made me so tough, not only physically, but mentally. It made me one of the toughest, you know, I, I think that's one of the reasons why I won is because I just, I, I thought I was mentally tougher than everybody. Like I, there was not a, a moment on the mat where I didn't think I was going to win. Um, so, uh, but with Chris, just to pull it back a little bit, Chris is like ultra transparent. Right. He sends out he sends out the, the workout plan a week ahead of time. So kids. So guys know. And, I, you know, and I'm like, I don't know. You know, maybe sometimes they shouldn't know. You know, they shouldn't know. They should just come in and be like, hey, we're, you're going to wrestle. I don't know. I don't know. It might be two minutes. It might be freaking 50. You better be ready, though. You better be ready for a two minute go. And you better be ready to wrestle for an hour. All right. And but I, 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 I think our guys do appreciate going back to like when we pull back and when we push through our guys know that from the jump so say like because we don't want them to think that their voices aren't heard right like hey we saw we saw you know the google sheet we know you guys are hurting right now we know you're hurting mentally we know you're hurting physically so a we're either gonna pull back and we tell them hey today we had a plan to go really hard but we're gonna pull back all right, we're going to pull back. We're going to do spar matches instead of regular matches or whatever the case may be. Or we say, hey, we know you're hurting, but we're, we need you to push through. We need you to be focused mentally coming into this practice. I know you're not feeling good, but I, we need you to be focused for an hour and 15 minutes and just give us all the intensity you got. And we promise you this will be this will this will benefit us in the end. That makes sense. Yeah, that because then when you when you ask them, when you ask them, hey, look, we we gotta go, we gotta go today. Can you give it to me for seventy five minutes? The answer is gonna be yes, as opposed to man, you just freaking asked me to do it last week. Yeah, again, it's kind of bullshit, dude. So yeah, that makes all the sense in the world. Um, all right, man. Well, thank you so much, Joey, for jumping on. Man, I, I really do appreciate. it. I'm gonna get out there to see you guys here pretty soon. You know, hey, you're always welcome. You know you can't stay out of Jersey too long. I can. I can and I will. No. <laughs> Get you back, baby. Get you all back. Right, hey, all guys. Right, thanks for having me on, all right? Thank you, brother. I'll talk to you.